Um, so we'll just be going through the renal system uh, today. I know you haven't really started lectures on it after talking to some of the uh, other second years. So this will be more of an introduction and obviously the lectures will build on the stuff that we talk about today. So I'll just go through some of the congenital abnormalities of the kidney and uh, urinary tract or kakut for short. And I'll also talk about some of uh, the basic anatomy of the urinary system, um, just to give you a bit of an introduction first. Um, so just a really quick snapshot of the urinary system. Obviously you have the kidneys, um, which do the uh, filtering for the urinary system. Um, the ureters take uh, the urine from the kidneys to the bladder and obviously the urethra um, excretes the urine. In terms of um, like vessels, you have the inferior vena cava, which gives rise to the left and right uh, renal veins. And then you've also got the descending aorta, uh, which give rise to the uh, renal arteries. On the right, you'll see a nephron, which is the basic uh, functional unit of the kidney, which uh, does the filtering. Looks uh, pretty complex, but um, after you cover all the, the renal lectures, it should be uh, pretty straightforward and you, you'll understand what's going on here. Um, quite high yield, um, the stuff to do with the nephron. I won't be talking through it um, in this part, but yeah, definitely pay attention to the roles of the different parts of the nephron and um, different like drugs and diuretics will act on in different parts of this uh, functional unit. Okay, just to do with um, embryology, it's probably not too high yield. I uh, don't remember seeing many, if any questions popping up on the mid-year exam or the via on um, like renal embryology, but still obviously, uh, pay attention to it because as uh, uh, Michelle Lazarus says, hashtag embryology matters. So it does link in quite nicely to some uh, pathologies. Uh, it does link in also to reproductive embryology in semester two. Um, and that was a few questions popped up on that on our end of year exam. But overall, don't sweat the small stuff when it comes to embryology. And I'll just be providing a very brief summary as to what happens in uh, like renal embryology and some of those developmental abnormalities. But the lectures are a much better indication of how much you actually need to know uh, for that. And obviously your lecturers will be the ones writing your uh, semester, end of semester and end of year exams. So pay attention to what pops up in those. Okay, so just some very basic background on how the kidneys actually develop. So you would have seen these diagrams before. Uh, essentially, uh, this is uh, it shows the embryonic development in the different regions of the embryo, and you'll become familiar um, with the different plates uh, and what they give rise to. Specifically, the kidneys arise from the intermediate mesoderm. So, if you look on the right, you can see um, where that's actually located. And essentially, there are three structures that the intermediate mesoderm will give rise to the pronephros, mesonephros, and metanephros. And these are all ducts that come out from the, um, the intermediate mesoderm. So starting off with the pronephros, this is just a transient structure um, that's actually not able to excrete urine. It doesn't really play much of a role uh, within the developing embryo. It simply appears in week four and then regresses completely within a week. It's nothing really too important there. The mesonephros is a bit more important. It appears late in week four, uh, below or caudal to that pronephros, which ends up degenerating. And it functions as a bit of an interim kidney within, um, within the embryo. And there will be ureteric buds, which sprout off and give rise to glomeruli. So if you remember from that um, image of the nephron, glomeruli is a part of that basic subunit and um, filters blood um, coming through. Eventually the mesonephros as well will degenerate like the pronephros, the pronephric duct, um, but the tubules will give rise to uh, different structures involved in the reproductive system. So the testes and uh, vas deferens in males and the ovaries in females. But don't worry about that too much at this stage because uh, you'll get a few lectures on reproductive embryology uh, next semester. 
There is also a duct running alongside the mesonephros, which we call uh, the paramesonephric duct, kind of makes sense. And this will give rise to the uterus and uterine tubes in females and will degenerate in males. Okay, so I'm not sure what's happening here. Try and bring it up again um, and reshare it. Okay, sorry about that. Should be working now. Yeah, is that all good? Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, one slide looks like it's missing and that's the most important slide on the I metanephros. I'm happy to see if I can see it and then I'll share it or I'll get it from the other folder. Okay, yeah, that would be good. Thanks, David. Um, metanephros, here it is. The screen. That one? Yes, that's one. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we've talked about the pronephros and the mesonephros. So now the metanephros is actually what gives rise to the permanent kidney. And that appears in week five. And um, like the other two, it's a, a duct. And that starts urine production in week 10. Probably don't have to memorize the weeks. It's good to have a rough idea, but I think it'd be really cruel for them to assess that uh, on the end of year exam or mid year exams. Um, so the creation of these kidneys occur um, when the end of the mesonephros, which we call the ureteric bud, makes contact with a, a special type of tissue called the metanephric mesenchyme and collectively that will give rise to the various parts of the urinary system. So the ureteric bud, uh, which is the end of the mesonephros, will give rise to the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis is just the, the join between the um, kidneys and the ureters. So it will also give rise to the ureters and the collecting duct, which is uh, part of the nephron. Uh, the metanephric mesenchyme will give rise to the rest of the nephron. Um, so the glomeruli, uh, the uh, different tubules, the convoluted tubules, et cetera. Okay, um, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah, perfect. I'm really not gonna stress this at all, um, but there are different steps involved in nephron production. Um, and you'll get a few, um, oh, you'll probably get a lecture on this, um, but really, really low yield. I don't remember any questions popping up on this. Um, so don't stress it too much. Just feel free ha to have a look through it uh, afterwards. Okay. So what can go wrong? Well, um, if there are any sort of abnormalities in development, it can give rise to what we call kakut, or those congenital abnormalities of the kidney and urinary tract. These may, may be caused by um, mutations, uh, environmental factors, which we call mutagens or anything that gives rise to a mutation or some sort of obstruction of the urinary tract. And this will often be pathological and um, cause symptoms or require treatment because it may result in uh, kidney failure, urine backup, or nephron damage um, if it isn't actually treated. So I'll just go through some of those main congenital abnormalities now. Again, um, not too high yield. It's just good to have an idea of um, roughly what each of these abnormalities actually entails and, and a name for the abnormality. Okay. So starting off with... Uh, abnormalities of the kidney specifically. So there can be hypoplasia or dysplasia. Hypoplasia uh, refers to uh, a, a decrease in, in kidney size or like the number of nephrons and dysplasia um, refers to like abnormal growth of the kidney. And as you can see, um, the kidney on the right is much smaller than the one on the left. So that's an example of hypoplasia. Agenesis uh, refers to um, simply like a lack of development of the kidney, so only being left with uh, one kidney. Um, it might seem like, um, you know, that will be like disastrous for the development of the embryo, um, but 
they it can still survive with um, one kidney. Then there's multicystic dysplasia. So as I said before, dysplasia refers to abnormal growth. And you know, when you cover uh, cancers um, and also pathology in like third year, you'll um, have a bit more teaching on that. But multicystic dysplasia is a form of abnormal growth that causes a lot of cysts in the kidney. And that really impacts its ability uh, to filter blood and produce urine. Okay, next slide, please, David. Okay, so moving more um, to uh, ureter abnormalities. Uh, the first one is vesico-ureteral reflux. Might sound pretty complex, but if you break it down, uh, vesico refers to like the bladder, ureteral, more the ureters. So essentially it's reflux or the backflow of urine from the bladders um, to, the, to the ureters. That might be due to some sort of uh, obstruction potentially or narrowing stricture of the ureters somewhere. A duplex collecting system is when there are uh, two ureters connecting to one kidney um, and that can also lead to reduced filtering capacity. And then a ureteropelvic junction obstruction refers to, as the name suggests, um, an obstruction between the junction of the um, the ureters and also the, the renal pelvis or the, the start of the kidney essentially. And this can be pretty bad because it can cause uh, a backup of urine into the kidneys and that might lead to nephron damage over time. And the term hydronephrosis uh, refers to the accumulation of uh, water or urine in the kidneys. Okay, um, I think this should be, yeah, okay, that's it. Um, so. Pretty short introduction to embryology, but um, as I said before, not too high yield. And if you do have any questions, feel free to let me know. Otherwise, um, all the best. Thanks so much. That was really great. It was very clear. Great. So, Pamali, I believe you are here. Hello. 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 Um, do I need to screen share or? Um, if you want to, I can screen share if you'd rather as well. Yeah, could you do that? That'd be amazing. I'm just plugging in my laptop. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'll just wait a second. Um, so, hey guys, my name is Pamali. Um, so I'll just be running through some of the main clinical conditions found in the renal, like in under the renal system. Um, luckily, I just came off my um, renal rotation. So I've seen quite a few of these things in person. And I'll tell you like what I've seen a lot of, what I haven't. And for your exams, like what's high yield, what's not too high yield either. Um, so just, yeah, next. Um, so starting off with acute... Um, renal failure or acute um, kidney injury. They're like interchangeable, but the definition is that it's an abrupt decline in your um, glomerular filtration rate. And that just results in the accumulation of nitrogenous waste. And usually we um, say it's over hours to days. So clinically, when you're looking at a patient with an AKI, you'll see some of these um, potential signs. So you'll see lots of fluid retention. So typically ankle edema, which will be pitting. And um, I've seen from like, it's like around the ankle, but peripheral edema that goes up into like the groin as well. So sometimes they can get pretty bad. Uh, also pulmonary edema. So that's just gonna be fluid in your lungs and that you'll see the patient with a lot of like shortness of breath. And with all this fluid, you'll also see a lot of weight gain um, just because of that accumulation of fluid. And something that they do to see how much like the, kidney function is that they can actually weigh the patient every now, every day or so, just to see if there's extra weight gain or weight loss. Um, and we can attribute that to like fluid loss or fluid gain. And just because I'm sure you guys have learned um, a bit about the kidney and its importance with like electrolytes and balancing um, electrolytes. So when there is kidney injury or kidney failure, there will be electrolyte disturbances. And one thing you'll see is hyperkalemia and that can cause your arrhythmias and metabolic acidosis, which I think we'll definitely go into 
detail later on um, when we look at your like acidosis and alkalosis. And um, something else that can happen is that urea can accumulate in the body and you'll see like a, a bunch of different symptoms. So the common ones is um, you'll see a lot of fatigue, but urea accumulation can also lead to nausea, vomiting and even um, confusion. And we call that encephalopathy as well. So with your AKIs, the best way to think of them are as your pre-renal, your intrarenal, and your post-renal. So pre-renal, that's to do with your um, blood flow to the kidney. So if there's something wrong blocking that blood flow, you get hypoperfusion of blood to the kidney, um, and that can just cause a rapid decline in your um, GFR. So for example, you can think of your hypovolemia. So um, you can have diuretic, diuresis, uh, you can have just normal, just low volume. So if you have really bad blood loss, vomiting, diarrhea. Also other causes could be your cardiac failure, um, your drugs. So we'll have a look at the triple whammy soon, but um, NSAIDs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, all that can affect your GFR, your glomerular filtration rate, and also renal artery stenosis. So if you guys know a little bit about your anatomy, the renal artery is what feeds into the kidneys. So if there's stenosis there, that means the, um, the, the lumen will be smaller and there'll be less blood flow that will lead to hypoperfusion. Um, next is your intrarenal. So there are two types um, usually. So you have your glomerulonephritis and you have electron I think next week in a lot more detail. But basically what happens is just damage to the nephron. And what happens is when the nephron gets damaged, the permeability can increase because obviously there's damage in that barrier. And then there's a less of a pressure gradient. And that actually means there's less of a GFR and that can cause an AKI. And um, a lot of um, AKIs can be caused this way, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then also tubular necrosis. And that's what I've, there's a diagram here below which shows it. So, um, ischemic or toxic um, factors can come and it can cause like a cast to form um, on the tubules itself. And that can cause like within the nephron um, um, problems with your GFR and that's going to cause an AKI. And post-renally, just some, anywhere along the urinary tract, you have an obstruction. So that means that there's like your urine's not going to leaves it's obstructive and that means there's going to be a backlog of like urine and fluids back into the nephron and that's just going to change your just whenever you, your pressure gradient changes it can cause your GFR to decrease and then again an AKI. Hmm. Um, so the diagnostics that you need to know um, just remember oliguria and um, your like an increase in serum catenine I think that's all you really need to know in second year but um, to be more specific, you might see an increase of your creatinine um, greater than 0.3 within 48 hours, or if it goes 0.5 above your base, um, 0.5 times above your baseline within seven days, we can classify that as an AKI. Or if your like urine output just dramatically decreases for more than six hours, they would also classify that as an AKI. And the way we treat it is just we've got to figure out the underlying cause of the disease and just treat it. So if it's like high. Um, if, if it's hypovolemic, so you'd give your diuretics. If it's hypovolemic, we want to give fluids. If it's um, to do with your glomerular disease, you want to treat that. Um, so treat infection, or if it's to do with nephritis, yeah, treat infection there as well. So just remember, we want to treat the underlying cause. Um, so onto chronic renal failure, this is just um, having a decreased GFR for more than three months. So three months is like an important number you need to remember, which is what makes it chronic. And um, usually we see a lot of diabetic nephropathy. So I'd say like on my rotation, literally 70% of the patients with chronic kidney disease, I'd say, well, because they're diabetics. Um, and that's just because I'm sure you guys have done, have you guys done endocrine? I'm not too sure, but you learn that diabetes can cause damage to like blood vessels and kidney cells. Um, but also hypertension is a big cause, and so is glomerulonephritis. Um, but there are also other causes like polycystic kidney disease, which is a, I think, an autosomal 
dominant um, genetic disorder, which results in like cysts in your kidneys, um, misuse of analgesia, and even like um, obesity can cause this special type of glomerulonephritis, which will be covered later on. Um, so the signs and symptoms of CKD are really vast. So the best way to think of it is like use a flow chart. And that's how I learned mine. Um, just look at the function of the kidney and what would happen if it gets interrupted. Um, so if we follow one of them, you'll see like, you'll see elimination of nitrogenous waste is one of the really important functions of a kidney. So if that's disrupted, you'll have accumulation of nitrogenous waste, which will lead to your uremia. And that's gonna have a bunch of different um, manifestations. And I've listed the manifestations on the side. Um, so in your CKD patients, I say the most common symptoms you do see are going to be like your fluid accumulations, um, seeing quite a lot of itchiness. So like, cause um, uremia can cause itch. So I've seen lots of like scratch marks and stuff, uh, lots of anemia and um, obviously cardiac failure is linked with CKD. So whenever you're looking at a patient with CKD, you need to think about maybe they might have heart failure as well. Um, but for this, it's just best to draw flow charts and memorize it. And you can um, categorize your CKD into different levels depending on um, your GFR and, and albumin as well. And obviously, as it goes from green to red, it gets more serious. Um, and when we're looking at investigating, we can look at your analysis, um, which we'll have a talk, like just we'll have a look at some of the results later. Um, but they're markers of kidney damage. And then you can also have a look at your UECs, which are your urea, electrolytes, and creatinine. Um, and we can use that to estimate your GFR. And then you can also use an ultrasound because in like severe CKD, the kidneys can get fibrosed. And treatment, once again, we want to under, treat the underlying condition. Sometimes we give patients ACE inhibitors. Um, and there's some special stuff we can add on if they're diabetic or if they have hypercholesterol. And we can also give calcium channel blockers. And in patients with really, really impaired kidney function, we want to put them onto dialysis. Um, I'm not sure if you guys know much about dialysis, but it's basically when the kidney can't work anymore, then the kidney does is filter blood, right? So what the machine does, it takes blood out, filters it and puts it back in your body. Um, so we have hemodialysis, which is kind of like with the machine beside you, you'll, it's what, something you'll see more commonly. And then you have peritoneal dialysis where they actually use the peritoneum as the space where they filter the blood. And that can be done at home, which is pretty cool. And then obviously if it gets really bad, they can get their kidney transplanted. Um, renal stones. So um, renal stones, they, so you need to know this kind of like buzzwordy for your exams. So the three common places of constriction so you have your pelvis, um, which is in that junction. You can have a stone getting lodged over the ureter as it passes um, over the iliac vessels. So that's at your pelvic brim. And then once again, you can have the stone being lodged at the entrance to the bladder. So that's very buzzwordy. So it's important that you guys know those like three spots. And... Um, And this is also a really important buzzword, loin to groin pain that comes in waves. You think renal stones or kidney stones. That's just because what happens is when the stones are lodged, the ureters will attempt peristalsis, which um, I'm sure you guys might remember from GIT, just like when the, like, the contractions occur like along a tube sort of structure. So when the stone is lodged, you'll have this waves coming in and going. So that's what your patient will usually present with alongside potentially nausea, dysuria, increased frequency, and even hematuria. And these are just some of the types of stones. I think the most common are calcium stones, um, but you can see these other types of stones too. It's not that high yield knowing your types of stones. It's more like the presentation of loin to groin. <laughs> Investigation, so you can do a urinalysis um, for pathology to exclude infection. 
you can do your bloods and then you can do your imaging, which <clears throat> if the stone is greater than three centimeters, you can detect it on your ultrasound. And yeah, just as David mentioned, you can see calcium stones on x-ray. <clears throat> and treatment. So if it's less than five millimeters, you can just usually pass it spontaneously. It can be painful, but you can pass it. And as they get bigger, you need to look into some alternative methods. Um, so if it's um, about 10 millimeters, you can use this method called shockwave lithotropy, which is a blasting the stone, or you can use like surgically removing through percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Nephrolithotomy. There you go. I'm really bad at pronouncing things. But those aren't as high yield. Um, just know your symptoms um, and what the patient might present with. Incontinence. So um, there are two types, two causes of incontinence usually. So you have neurogenic, which is usually due to like a neurological dysfunction. And that's usually associated with um, a lower spinal lesion and non-neurogenic, which is usually idiopathic. And you need to rule out your other causes first. So there are different types of um, incontinence. So you can have your stress incontinence, which is usually um, weakening of your pelvic floor. So you get involuntary loss of, like, um, of, of that um, pelvic floor like strength during um, physical exertion or an effort. And that can lead to like passing of urine because of the incontinence. Urge, um, that's usually associated with urgency. Um, mixed incontinence is a bit of both. Postural. Uh, when the patient, when the person like moves or changes their posture, that can lead to involuntary loss of continence. Um, overflow, this is seen um, associated with chronic retention, and you see it in older men with like large prostates. Um, so like if they have um, BPH, which is benign prostate hyperplasia, where the prostate enlarges, you can have overflow incontinence, and nocturnal enuresis, which is just a bedwetting in children. Um, UTIs, this is just a very quick overview. I think there's a more in-depth um, topic. It'll be, sorry, it'll be discussed a lot more in depth um, next week. But just know your differences between your lower and your upper or higher um, urinary tract infections. So lower, you'll see your dysuria increased frequency and you'll see cloudy or smell urine. Upper, you'll see, you get a fever. So when it's an upper UTI, it'll be affecting your actual kid, kidney, um, so you'll get like that loin pain, back pain, vomiting, high fever. And your dipstick, you need to know these three. It's kind of like a buzzwordy again. Um, leukocytes, nitrites, and blood. And um, you need to make sure, sorry. <laughs> um, you need to make sure to get a midstream sample. And the level of bacteria has to be more than 10 to the power five. So that number is also buzzwordy. Um, but more on this next week. Um, your triple whammy, so you need to remember that these three drugs. So your ACE inhibitors actually can dilate your efferent um, vessel and that can decrease your GFR because there's um, more, leaving, more leaving and that can you know, affect the gradient. NSAIDs will constrict your afferent and that will also affect the gradient and diuretics will just in general reduce your plasma volume and that decreases your GFR. So just remember, never give a patient these three together because it can cause, it's a triple whammy. <laughs> so they're buzzwordy, you need to know that one. And lastly, glomerulonephritis. This will also be covered next week. But the important part is um, there are two types of glomerulonephritis. So glomerulonephritis is just a blanket term. Um, the first type is nephrotic syndrome, which is when your um, permeability barriers affected. And just know that nephrotic is to do with your proteinuria, so protein in the urine and um, nephritic is when there's injury and inflammation and that's going to cause your hematuria so blood in the urine and there's this really nice diagram that covers that so you can have a look at that later and just quickly i'll be running through the history and examination of the you know, renal system um, so always start off with introducing yourself and um, start off with, you know, what's brought you in and do your WWQQAA and then your BICE as well. 
Um, so just a type of pains to look out for. So dysuria could indicate a UTI. Lone pain could be like an upper UTI or infection. Could also be like stones or a tumor or an infarction. And remember, like I said before, lone to groin is your like renal stones classic. So make sure you run through all those. Um, so in your systems review, so if, if the history of presenting complaint isn't pain, make sure you ask about pain. Um, and after you've covered pain, I like to end with, do you have pain when you urinate? And then make that like segue into asking about urination. So like frequency, volume, hesitancy, dribbling, if they have to pee at night, if their flow is impeded or slow, if their stream is affected, or if they're having any incontinence. Um, you just have to practice um, doing the systems review. It'll come to you naturally, but the best way is just to do you know, stations and practice with your friends. Um, and just a side note, you need to ask a bit specific about the appearance of the urine. So if it has color in it, um, so if, the, if it's pinkish, you think hematuria. If it's dark, you want to think about your jaundice. Um, so that's really important. If it's really, really yellow, maybe they're dehydrated. Um, frothy, so frothy could be a sign of lipids in the urine. And we actually see that in nephrotic syndrome, so which is a type of glomerulonephritis. Um, you could have a, a really offensive smell as well. Um, and never forget to ask about fevers. Um, it's, not, it's always going to be a part of your system's review for any system. And um, if, you, if, you're con if you're thinking chronic kidney disease, maybe just ask if they're feeling like um, any particular like nauseousness, vomiting, they've been having fluid accumulating anywhere in their body. Um, so ask those like specific symptoms as well. And just some important parts of the history to look for. Um, remember, ask about their past history and I've included all like the renally relevant things in this slide. So family history, um, hypertension and diabetes is really important if you're looking at CKD. Medication, see if they're taking any of those triple whammy medications. Um, ask if they've had a, um, a imaging that's used contrast recently because that actually is um, some a way we can you can have an AKI. So contrast used for like um, angiograms and stuff can cause an AKI and look if they have any specific um, risk factors in their social history as well. Um, almost done, just quickly through the physical exam. Introduce yourself, hand hygiene is really important these days. Um, looking at the general appearance, do they look, do they have pallor? Are they, do they have the sallow complexion, which is kind of like, like dirt looking on their skin that hasn't been rubbed off properly. That's what you see. Um, I haven't personally seen any of that, but I've seen a lot of like dehydration and pallor. Do they have urinary bags attached? So you can have a quick look at that if they do. Um, you can see if they have hematuria or anything. And this one, um, are they attached to a dialysis machine? They could be attached to like a peritoneal dialysis machine as well. So you need to mention that in your OSCE. Um, then moving on to the hands. So have a look at if they have um, leukonychia, which is where they have that whitening. So that's the first image. Do they have coilonychia, which is the spooning of the nail? Um, do they have pallor of their palmar creases? So the pallor will indicate um, potential anemia. You can test their skin turgor. So if, it, if they don't have much turgor, that could mean that they're dehydrated. They could have a fistula, which um, is just where they will join up an artery and a vein. And it's this graft that they can use for dialysis. Never, ever, ever, ever take blood or touch this um, fistula. Your <laughs> doctors will get very, do doctors and nurses will get really, really mad. Um, but if you feel it, um, you'll feel that it has a little thrill over it, um, which is pretty cool. And then you want to check for your um, asterixis or your flappy tremor, which is where you just ask them to hold their arms up like this. And if it starts flapping, it means they have um, a lot of urea in the body. <clears throat> Moving on to the face, see if they have jaundice. Um, you can ask them to pull their um, eyelids down, see if they have any pallor of the conjunctiva. If they could have xanthalesma, like um, fat, fatty buildup around the eyes and really bad like uric breath, um, which is just a sign of urea buildup. And then you want to test, test for your JVP. I remember in second year, I was so confused what a JVP was like. 
because you, you're online and you do it on your friends and obviously none of us are going to have increased JVPs. Um, so I really recommend going on Google and maybe searching up on, maybe on YouTube and having a look at what a JVP looks like. It is very, very obvious in patients who have fluid overload. Like I had a patient who you didn't even need to tell him to lean back and look away. Like he's just sitting like this and you can see like the JVP. So it's pretty obvious um, when you're on your wards. Um, legs, so pitting edema, um, just press down. So start at the ankle and work your way up um, to see where it ends. And if it's pitting, uh, like in that picture, it'll leave a pit. And then kind of move to the lungs, have a listen to the lungs. If there's fluid buildup, you'll hear like crackles. Um, and while your patient's sitting up, you can check for sacral edema as well. Um, and you'll only see sacral edema if there's really, really bad pitting edema that's gotten up to your sacro. And almost done. So abdomen, look for scars. So they might have a kidney transplant scar or a um, scar from their peritoneal dialysis. Look for distension around the flank. So that could be from your um, polycystic kidney disease. Palpate and cuss. Um, so palpate, you can through the abdomen do your light and deep palpation that you would have done in GIT. And then if you um, hear dullness on percussion, um, you might think, okay, maybe they have ascites fluid overload. You can test for your shifting dullness, which I'm pretty sure you guys would have done in uh, GIT. And last but not least, you want to ballot your kidneys. So this one you need to practice. Like it's, it's hard to explain online, but you want to put one hand underneath the patient's flank. So I think this picture has a good job of showing it. And one hand on top. Um, some people do this thing where they like to bounce it between the two hands um, to feel if the kidneys enlarge or anything. I personally like to keep my top one flat and push up with the hand on the bottom. But just to each their own, practice, see what, what you prefer. Um, but you shouldn't really feel anything on a normal person only if it's really enlarged. And then you can hear for renal brewies um, with your step. And if you do hear a brewy, it's a sign of stenosis. And that could be, if you think about your AKIs, that could be a pre-renal cause of an AKI. Um, and just last but not least, urinalysis. So just come back, look at this table. Just it shows you why we why each thing has <laughs> what like what the role is. So leukocyte infection. Um, protein, you might have protein urea, which could be nephrotic syndrome. You could have blood, um, ketones. Glucose, so just, just come back and it's just important to memorize what each of the um, boxes mean on your urinalysis. But I'm pretty sure you guys will be doing this in uh, clinical skills. And I think that's all from me. Yeah. Any questions, guys? No? Thanks so much. That was really great. Oh, no that, problem. My pleasure. It's a good introduction, I reckon. That'll be really helpful. Yeah, I love kidney stuff. So if you guys have any questions, just message me. Like I'm down to help. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so make use of that. <laughs> um, if you guys don't have any other questions, I think that's it. Thanks so much. Thank oh, you. My pleasure. Bye, guys. Enjoy your second year. <laughs> hey, Chris. How are you doing? Thank you. Can we share the slides? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I can share them for you if that's more convenient as well. Actually, yeah, that'll be good. Thanks. No worries. Um, um, so, hi, I'm Chris, and I'm going to cover um, investigations of jaundice. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just an intro on the reticular endothelial system. So basically it breaks down heme um, and particularly that's the spleen that does it. So 80% of heme uh, will come from hemoglobin, 20% um, from other things. And then heme will get converted into biliverdin, which is like a greenish um, pigment, which will become unconjugated bilirubin, which is like an orangey color. Uh, next slide. Um, so unconjugated bilirubin is then sent to the liver, 
So it has to be, it has to be bound to albumin as it is water insoluble. Um, and then unconjugated bilirubin would be conjugated with glucuronic acid to become conjugated bilirubin. And then most of the conjugated bilirubin enters the biliary system um, into the GIT at the second part of the duodenum. Um, so 95% of bilirubin is absorbed in the terminal ileum. Um, it will get taken up into the portal circulation and goes back to the liver. So the other 5% is hydrolyzed by like your gut bacteria to form urobilinogen, which is colorless. So three things can happen to it. So the first thing is it can be oxidized by gut bacteria and uh, it will become stercobilin, which is what makes your feces the color they are. Um, second thing is it can be excreted in urine. So it will become urobilin once oxidized in air and it will give your urine that color as well. And the third thing that can happen is it can be reabsorbed by the portal system. Um, so jaundice, so what is jaundice? So it's basically your yellow appearance of your skin um, caused by excessive bilirubin in the blood. Um, so it's de detectable when your serum bilirubin is three times more than the upper limit of normal. Um, so um, when you think about the causes of jaundice, break them down into before the liver, so prehepatic, um, liver, so hepatic, and then after the liver, so post-hepatic. Um, so in prehepatic, you have causes like um, excessive hemolysis. Um, you have things like congenital stuff, so things like Gilbert's disease, and then you can have neonatal jaundice, and that's because your liver isn't really that developed to take up all the blood. Um, and then you diagnose it with bloods, so you want to look at your unconjugated bilirubin level. So because it's before the liver, it hasn't been conjugated yet. Um, so unconjugated bilirubin, we measure it in an indirect way. So we measure the total bilirubin and then we take away conjugated bilirubin. Um, yeah, so in your urine, you'll increase your bilirubin. Sorry, I couldn't pronounce it properly. And, um, but your conjugated bilirubin won't increase. Next slide, please. Um, so we'll skip hepatic for now. Uh, we'll move on to post-hepatic. So the main cause of post-hepatic jaundice is obstruction. So things like gallstones, um, things like tumors. So head of the pancreas is really buzzwordy and um, tumors of the liver can also do it and stasis of the bile. Um, so the way it works is because your conjugated bilirubin cannot get into the gut, it spills into the bloodstream. So remember conjugated bilirubin is water soluble and then it gets excreted in your urine and it will give it a dark appearance. Um, because you've got decreased stercobilin, um, it's the color that makes your stool brown. So your stools will be pale instead. So hepatocellular or intrahepatic um, is a mixture of both. Um, so it's actually damaged to the liver so things like hepatitis, things like alcohol, things like um, non-alcoholic statoresis, um, things like that can cause it. So the way it works is um, damage to hepatocytes can affect both their uptake and the transport of conjugated bilirubin into the gallbladder. Um, so early, it's a mixed picture, but late, often conjugated jaundice dominates because your liver becomes fibrosed, and so it will affect transport. Um, so this is just a list of buzzwords. Um, and yeah, so for example, if you have pain in the right upper quadrant, colicky after fatty meal, there's probably your gallstone stuff. Um, if you have like a person with blood transfusion or are doing risky behavior, so it might be hepatitis B or C. Um, yeah, just look at it in your own time. Um, so examination. Um, so multiple systems are possible. So you want to use your history to tailor what you kind of do. For example, um, if the liver is enlarged and it feels hard, um, it might be malignancy. Um, and that's 
just an interesting point. Jaundice goes from the eyes down. So always check the eyes first. Um, so investigation. So you want to look at your bilinogen. Um, you want to look at bilirubin. So that's part of your urinalysis. So when you do your urine dipstick, you have a look at that. Um, you want to look at ALP and GGT. So these are produced by epithelial cells um, in the biocanaliculi. And so if it's a gallbladder sort of thing, post-hepatic thing, these two might be elevated, whereas your ALT and AST, so transaminases, they're contained within hepatocytes. So when your liver gets damaged, they'll spill out and their levels will increase. Um, specific investigations that you might want to do are viral screen for um, things like hepatitis, um, immunology, imaging, so that's your um, ultrasound for gallstones, and um, you could do an abdo x-ray CT for cancer, and then you could also do an ERCP for like gallstones. Okay, um, so this is a bit more niche stuff. Um, so if only ALT is elevated, um, it might indicate things like paracetamol overdose, viral hepatitis, ischemic hepatitis. Um, if only AST is elevated, it might indicate um, rhabdomyolysis, but don't worry about this too much. Um, if only GGT is elevated, that indicates alcohol abuse. Um, and if only ALP is elevated, that's high bone turnover. Um, so you might have um, bone cancer, um, hyperparathyroidism, or um, Paget's disease. And um, just a bit of technicalities, um, your real LFTs are actually bilirubin, INR, um, albumin, and platelets. Um, this is because your liver synthesizes these, and so it indicates the liver's synthetic function. Um, yeah. Um, so I stole this from last year's revision lecture. Um, this was pretty good. Um, and so you have your patterns. Um, so if you have acute hepatitis, that's like your liver stuff. So your transaminases will be high. Um, your bilirubin can be mixed because remember that's hepatocellular, a bit of both pictures. Um, if you have alcohol binge, your GGT will be elevated like I said earlier. Um, if you have biliary obstruction, that's when your bilirubin is conjugated and your ALP and GGT will be increased. Um, if you have chronic liver disease, um, your bilirubin will be high and mixed. Your ALT and AST will be only mildly elevated because that's like a chronic picture, not an acute picture. And just last slide, I think one of your lecturers showed you this. I could never understand it, but it's just here for your reference if you want. Any questions? Thanks so much, Chris. That was really great. Really good presentation, so. Um, do we need to know the functions of AST? All I remember is um, you might need to know where else you can find AST. Um, I think knowing what elevations mean is more important. Um, but if you want more information, ALT is the most liver specific, whereas your AST can be found in your liver, um, your skeletal muscle, your cardiac muscle. And so if you have diseases affecting those areas, it might increase as well. So you can have AST increases in things like AMI um, because it's found in cardiac muscle. Uh, yeah, elevation is more important. Right, yeah, Chris, thanks so much your time and everything. Good, thanks. Cool. Alex, welcome. 
Hi hey everyone, I'm Alex. So I'll just be going over integrative medicine. Um, feel free to ask anything if you have any questions. Um, all right, I'll, let's get started. So the um, basic before I start, basic um, yeah, um, integrative medicine. Um, there's a lot of random facts, but if there's any one thing you take away from this um, lecture is that. Uh, the brain is like a muscle in a sense that um, if you don't use your muscles, it will fall into disuse and problems will occur. And also if you don't use that muscle correctly, the um, problems will also occur. And that same principle applies to your brain as well. So um, getting started, technology overall, what we say about technology is technology is bad. Typing notes is um, not as good as handwriting notes because it's associated with impaired learning, shallow processing, impaired conceptual understanding. And there's a lot of brain changes associated with technology, such as impaired attentional capacity, altered memory processes, and also um, alteration of the, your self-conception and self-esteem. So overall, um, these changes can be uh, summarized as technology um, inc increases um, distraction, apathy, and stress all overall. It's associated with more attention problems uh, such as ADHD. It's um, addictive as well, and it's being likened to similar effects of substance abuse and personality disorders. This is especially true for social media use, which um, although it can be good if you make meaningful social connections, most of the time it has this um, social reward system and resulting anxiety, social, um, uh, so, um, social self-esteem decreasing and so on. It's linked to narcissism, depression, anxiety, stress symptoms. And there's also known that in your body, there's, you have excessive sympathetic nervous system um, response that's being associated as similar to poor gambling behavior and decision-making. Um, Gender-wise, it seems that men are more affected by tech use. For example, playing video games, um, males are associated with increased borderline and abnormal conduct and emotional problems. And also TV is associated with increased rates of ADHD in males, though it seems that um, among females, the TV is not as associated with ADHD. Overall, unhappiness increases steadily with increasing screen time. Internet addiction um, is shown to have precede emotional dysregulation, though there's no clear link between using computer use and emotional behavior problems. It's pretty much um, what you use it for. It's not like that the, the um, the computer is toxic. It's just associated with behaviors that aren't very good for your brain. And media violence contributes to desensitization and increase in aggressive behavior in children. So not good for um, development. And speaking of the um, apathy I was talking about, apathy can be seen as like disuse of the brain, which like the disuse of the muscle causes problem. So more severe apathy is associated with increased dementia risk. Um, dementia um, is associated with a molecule known as amyloid with high deposits being seen in Alzheimer's disease. And this, the uptake of amyloid is reduced when you have positive cognitive stimulation, such as reading, writing, and playing games. Um, if if the, the leisure activities you have um, aren't very diverse, then and that they're very passive, for example, watching TV as opposed to exercise, and if you don't take too much time to have leisure activities. This increases this um, dementia, sorry, let's just say dementia, dementia risk as mentioned. And it's improved by mental um, techniques such as mind body exercises and meditation. Essentially any type of mental stimulation improves physical functioning, even when you have Alzheimer's and also reduces the uh, risk of depression because depression is also associated with dementia. And to summarize, um, protective factors from dementia are physical exercise, diverse leisure activities, mental stimulation, marriage and social contracts, so positive social relationships, and stimulating work. While some risk factors are, the big one is major psychiatric illness. It increases your chances of dementia three to four times. High stress, passive leisure activities, such as watching the TV, social isolation, unprotected unproductive working style, and also passivity, which is known as the default mode. So here's the diagram of your brain. The in blue is the so-called default state, which is inattentive, distracted, daydreaming, recalling. So it's basically um, when you turn your brain off in the sense like daydreaming during class, so on. 
And in red is the brain in Alzheimer's. As you can see, the same states um, that are activated in default state are similar to the states in Alzheimer's. They, there's an, it's very similar to each other, which is why the default state can lead to dementia, as said here. So in contrast, the active task, which is when the brain is engaged in, is engaged and relatively quiet, is associated with paying attention. And it's um, basically mental stimulation, which helps reduce the effect of um, apathy from degrading your brain. Um, it's also can be, in, can be triggered through mindfulness, which is associated with improving your many things. So from executive function, attention, self-regulation, sensory processing, memory, but also some, not so um, obvious things such as st stress response regulation, fluid intelligence, which yoga and meditation also helps, resilience, the global network efficiency of your brain, and also the youth of your brain. So you might have heard telomeres, so it, that's what it aids in. And also um, mental exercise, funnily enough, is also good for stroke rehabilitation. This is probably a good thing to know about is that um, when you rehearse the movements in your brain, so you kind of like practice, think about what you're going to do with your movements before actually moving your hands, for example, it activates the same musculature and neural networks as in actually physically performing the movement, which is especially useful in stroke, where it might be a bit difficult to actually actively move, the, um, move your muscles. And here's um, something known as psychoneuroendocrinology immunology what it basically meant is talking about is how the mind is linked to immunology basically the mind communicates through two pathways the nervous cable pathway and endocrine postal pathway and immune defenses are can be cellular or humoral and as a result of this the two kind of facets the mind and immune defenses do communicate so you have things such as placebo and associations can induce allergic reactions in asthma. And this principle can also lead um, doctors to know that it can also condition, you can also condition immunosuppression. So basically, if you trick the mind into certain associations uh, associated with allergic reactions, inflammation, so on, the body actually responds to it. So this dysregulation and exacerbation of the autoimmune system can be triggered by things such as stress and unsupportive social environments in contrast um you can if stress is decreased the opposite is true as well so, which is why the things listed here so positive social experiences mindfulness compassion and happiness can actually reduce the inflammatory response and hold on yeah so it's yeah the inflammation also has effects on your central nervous system directly in that the inflammation can result in the blood brain barrier having increased permeability. This leads to more inflammatory molecules invading the central nervous system, leading to structural camp changes in your brain, mainly the hippocampus. And this can lead to depressive changes, which is why it's previously mentioned here, stress, high stress is a risk factor for dementia. It's all linked in a sense. And Yep, so laughter is one of the positive ways to decrease stress. It's associated with many of these things. So relaxation techniques, mood, so on. And also some less obvious um, effects such as improving your terminal illness, medical procedure coping, improving your pain threshold, immunity, blood and lymph flow, oxygenation, muscles, and even lifespan. Yep, sorry. And in contrast, it also reduces anxiety, stress, distress, stress hormones, depression, and blood pressure. And now, there's also um, these studies showing that music can help in, help in your health and mind. It's music has been shown that it can help in aiding in psychosis, mainly negative symptoms. So you, they'll discuss this later on, but positive symptoms are basically symptoms that add something to the disease. For example, hallucinations and um, auditory hallucinations, while negative symptoms are symptoms associated with a condition that shows an absence of something. For example, in schizophrenia, while the hallucinations are a positive symptom, negative symptoms include apathy and so on. So as you might realize music aids this kind of negative aspects of psychosis, which can help improve treatment. 
with also therapeutic effects, which is shown to have improved um, relaxation, pain symptom management, very similar to what I mentioned before. And it also improves melatonin levels, which is something interesting I noticed, whilst reducing cardiac reactivity, anxiety, and stress. So again, this um, changes depending on what type of music you have. Um, According to Hassett, there's a huge list of this, but the main thing to take away from music and the mind is that classical music is good, um, everything else, not so much. Um, fast tempo music is um, associated with increased assertive behavior, and there's a lot of associations between type of music, such as um, antisocial behavior and rock music, and certain different types of genres have different associations. But at, at the end of the day, there's, the evidence is a bit shaky. It's not um, causation so you can't say that music genre causes these effects but there's a correlation in that so the the music genre is indicative of certain types of um, behaviors and demographics and ultimately that's pretty much all there is to mind body medicine um, for now just remember that the mind is like a muscle you need to exercise it and you need to exercise it properly too much stress will cause negative effects similar to like too much stress on your muscles and also not using it at all will lead it to have problems. Uh, were there any questions? Alex, that was great. Thanks so much. It was very funny as well. I enjoyed that. Okay. See everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we hope you have a great week. Yeah, have a lot of fun.